The Goldcrest Hotel's revolving door spun, expelling a gust of air-conditioned breath into the sweltering New York summer. Walter Thompson's weathered hands, strong despite his 68 years, guided the door with practiced ease. His chocolate brown eyes, sharp as ever, caught the reflection of a man he hardly recognized anymore. Crisp uniform, polished shoes, and a forced smile that didn't quite reach those eyes. Who would have thought that Dr. Walter Thompson, once a firebrand civil rights activist and respected literature professor, would find himself here, opening doors for the elite. But Walter had a secret mission, one that required him to swallow his pride daily. Little did he know, today would test his resolve like never before. Before we dive into Walter's world, drop a comment telling us where you're tuning in from. Got a fun fact about your hometown? Share it below. Let's create a global tapestry of stories. Now let's step into the Goldcrest Hotel, where appearances can be deceiving and dignity comes in unexpected packages. The morning sun glinted off the Goldcrest Hotel's golden facade, a beacon of luxury in the heart of Manhattan. Inside, the lobby hummed with activity, a symphony of clicking heels, hushed conversations, and the gentle tinkling of crystal chandeliers. Walter Thompson stood at his post, back straight, chin high. To the casual observer, he was just another fixture in the opulent decor. But behind his impassive expression, a keen mind word, cataloging every interaction, every microaggression, every sidelong glance. Good morning, Mr. and Mrs. Rothschild, Walter said, his voice a rich baritone as he opened the door for a couple dripping in designer labels. Mrs. Rothschild's eyes slid over him as if he were invisible while Mr. Rothschild grunted something that might have been a greeting. Walter's pen itched in his breast pocket. Another note for his book, the one he'd been meticulously researching for the past year. The Invisible Man in the Golden Door, a study of modern discrimination, was more than just a clever title. It was Walter's reason for enduring this job. As the morning rush tapered off, Walter allowed himself a moment of reflection. He thought of Emma, his wife of 40 years and the concern that creased her forehead every time he left for work. He thought of Marcus, their son, a hotshot lawyer who believed his father was consulting for universities, not opening doors for the 1%. Walter's reverie was interrupted by the click-clack of expensive loafers on marble. Richard Hartley, the hotel's new manager, strode across the lobby, his face set in its perpetual sneer. Thompson, Hartley barked not bothering to look at Walter as he approached. I hope you're planning on doing some actual work today. I'm not paying you to daydream. Walter bit back the retort that sprang to his lips. I've forgotten more about literature and civil rights than you'll ever know, he wanted to say. Instead, he nodded deferentially. Yes, Mr. Hartley. Always working, sir. Hartley's lip curled. See that you do. And for God's sake, do something about that uniform. You look like you slept in it. As Hartley stalked away, Walter glanced down at his immaculate uniform, pressed to perfection by Emma just that morning. He took a deep breath, reminding himself why he was here. It's not about you, Walter, he thought. It's about exposing the truth. The day wore on, a parade of guests flowing in and out of the golden doors. Walter observed, noted, and endured. A group of executives brushed past him, their conversation floating back. Can you believe they're hosting that civil rights conference here next month? One said, his voice dripping with disdain. I know, another replied. It's going to bring down the tone of the whole place, but I guess even troublemakers have money to spend these days. Walter's heart raced. He hadn't known about the conference. The irony of it being held here in this bastion of privilege was not lost on him. He made a mental note to look into it further. As the afternoon sun began to dip, Casting long shadows across the lobby, Sarah Chen, the assistant manager, approached Walter. Unlike Hartley, Sarah always treated him with respect, though Walter sensed an internal conflict in her whenever she was caught between the staff and management. Walter, she said, her voice low. I'm sorry about Mr. Hartley earlier. He was out of line. Walter offered her a small smile. It's all right, Miss Chen. I've dealt with worse. Sarah looked like she wanted to say more but Hartley's voice boomed across the lobby. Chen, I need you in my office now. With an apologetic glance, Sarah hurried away. Walter watched her go, 
noting the stiffness in her shoulders. Another character in the drama unfolding around him. As his shift neared its end, Walter's thoughts turned to home, to Emma's cooking, to the quiet sanctuary of his study where he could shed the mask of the subservient doorman and be himself again. But fate had other plans. A commotion near the check-in desk drew his attention. A young black couple stood there, frustration evident in their body language as they argued with the receptionist. What do you mean our reservation is canceled? The woman was saying, her voice rising. We booked this months ago for our anniversary. Walter inched closer, straining to hear the receptionist's mumbled responses about computer errors and no available rooms. Hartley materialized, his face a mask of false sympathy. I'm terribly sorry for the inconvenience, he said, not sounding sorry at all. Perhaps you'd be more comfortable at the Holiday Inn down the street. I hear they have vacancies. The couple's faces fell, the woman's eyes glistening with unshed tears. Walter felt a familiar fire ignite in his chest. The same righteous anger that had driven him to march alongside Dr. King decades ago. Before he could stop himself, Walter stepped forward. Mr. Hartley, he said, his voice steady despite the adrenaline coursing through him. If I may, I believe Suite 1520 is unoccupied. It was being held for the Andersons, but they called earlier to cancel. Hartley's head snapped around, his eyes narrowing dangerously. Thompson, this doesn't concern you. Get back to your post. But Walter stood his ground. Sir, as you often remind me, my job is to ensure the comfort of our guests. All our guests. A tense silence fell over the lobby. The young couple looked between Walter and Hartley. Confusion and hope warring on their faces. Sarah, returning from Hartley's office, paused at the edge of the scene. Her eyes wide, Hartley's face flushed an ugly red. For a moment, Walter thought he might be fired on the spot. Then, miraculously, Hartley's shoulders sagged. Fine, he spat. Chen, get them checked in. Thompson, we'll discuss your insubordination later. As Hartley stormed off, the young couple turned to Walter, gratitude shining in their eyes. Thank you, the woman said softly. You didn't have to do that. Walter simply nodded, a small smile playing at the corners of his mouth. Enjoy your stay, he said, before returning to his post by the door. As the sun dipped below the New York skyline, painting the sky in hues of orange and pink, Walter finally ended his shift. He walked out of the gold crest, his back straight and his head held high. Today had been a small victory, but the war was far from over. Little did Walter know, his act of defiance had set in motion a chain of events that would shake the Gold Crest Hotel to its very foundations. The truth he sought to expose was closer to the surface than he realized, and the coming days would test not just his resolve, but the very essence of who he was. As he descended into the subway, leaving the glittering world of the gold crest behind. Walter couldn't shake the feeling that everything was about to change, for better or for worse, remained to be seen. The next morning dawned gray and humid, the air heavy with the promise of rain. Walter Thompson stood at his kitchen counter, hands wrapped around a steaming mug of coffee, his mind still at the gold crest. You're thinking about it again, aren't you? Emma's voice, warm and knowing, cut through his reverie. She stood in the doorway. Her silver hair caught up in a loose bun, concerns etched in the lines around her. Walter managed a small smile. Can't help it, love. Yesterday was eventful. Emma crossed the room, laying a gentle hand on his arm. Walter, I know this book means a lot to you, but at what cost? Every day you come home more exhausted, more diminished. I'm fine, Emma, Walter insisted, though the shadows under his eyes told a different story. This isn't just about the book anymore. It's about making a difference, even if it's just for one couple on their anniversary. Emma sighed, a sound caught between pride and worry. Just promise me you'll be careful. Men like that Hartley fellow, they don't take kindly to being challenged. Walter kissed her forehead, breathing in the familiar scent of her lavender shampoo. I promise. Now, I better get going before the dragon realizes I'm not there to open his precious door. As Walter left their modest apartment in Harlem, a text message buzzed in his pocket. It was from Marcus, their son. Dad, guess what? I've been invited to speak at some big civil rights conference next month. It's at that fancy hotel you're always talking about. The Gold Crest? 
Isn't that wild? Walter froze on the sidewalk, oblivious to the rush of commuters around him. His son, speaking at the Goldcrest. The universe, it seemed, had a twisted sense of humor. At the Goldcrest, the lobby was a flurry of activity. Walter had barely taken his position when Sarah Chen approached. Her usually calm demeanor ruffled. Walter, she said in a low voice. Mr. Hartley wants to see you in his office. Now, Walter nodded, bracing himself. As he made his way to the back offices, he caught snippets of excited chatter among the staff. Did you hear? The Civil Rights Conference. Biggest names in the movement. I heard even the governor might show up. Hartley's office door loomed before him, the polished nameplate gleaming like a threat. Walter knocked. Enter, came the curt reply. Hartley sat behind his massive desk, a scowl etched deeply into his features. Ah, Thompson, so good of you to grace us with your presence. Please enlighten me. When exactly did you decide that your job description included overriding management decisions? Walter stood tall, hands clasped behind his back. Mr. Hartley, I apologize if I overstepped. I was merely trying to... To what? Hartley cut in. Play the hero? I don't know what kind of game you think you're playing, Thompson, but let me make something crystal clear. You are a doorman, nothing more. Your job is to open doors, carry bags, and keep your mouth shut. Is that understood? The words stung, but Walter had faced worse. He simply nodded. Yes, sir. Hartley leaned back, a smug smile playing on his lips. Good. Now, given your enthusiasm for customer service, I have a special assignment for you. The Civil Rights Conference next month? You'll be working double shifts. Every entitled activist, every self-important speaker, they'll be your responsibility. Let's see how you like catering to troublemakers. It took every ounce of Walter's self-control not to react. If only Hartley knew who he was really dealing with. As you wish, Mr. Hartley. As Walter turned to leave, Hartley added, Oh, and Thompson, one more stunt like yesterday, and you'll be looking for a new job. Dismissed. Out in the hallway, Walter leaned against the wall, taking deep breaths. The situation was spiraling in ways he couldn't have predicted. His son speaking at the conference, Hartley's thinly veiled threats. The book still unfinished. Walter? Sarah's voice was tentative. She stood a few feet away, concern evident in her eyes. Are you okay? I'm so sorry about all this. Walter straightened, offering a wan smile. I'm fine, Ms. Chen. Nothing I can't handle. Sarah glanced around, then stepped closer. Listen, what you did yesterday, it was the right thing. Mr. Hartley, he doesn't represent all of us. Some of us see what's happening here. Before Walter could respond, the clickety-clack of heels on marble announced another arrival. A striking woman in her forties, impeccably dressed, strode towards them. Sarah, darling! The woman exclaimed, air kissing Sarah's cheeks. It's been too long. Sarah's demeanor changed instantly, a practiced smile sliding into place. Ms. Rothschild, what a pleasant surprise. How can I help you today? Clarissa Rothschild, Walter recognized her from check-ins, waved a manicured hand. Oh, I'm not staying. I'm here about the conference. The board is concerned about, well, you know, the type of people it might attract. We need assurances that our regular guests won't be inconvenienced. Sarah nodded. All professional efficiency. Of course, Ms. Rothschild. I can assure you we're taking every precaution. In fact, she glanced at Walter, an idea visibly forming. Our most experienced staff member, Mr. Thompson here, will be personally overseeing the conference arrangements. Clarissa's gaze fell on Walter as if noticing him for the first time. Her eyes narrowed slightly. The doorman? Mr. Thompson has been with us for years, Sarah said smoothly. He knows the hotel better than anyone. Walter, catching on, stepped forward with a deferential nod. It would be my pleasure to ensure everything runs smoothly, Ms. Rothschild. Clarissa looked unconvinced but shrugged. Well, if you say so, Sarah dear, just make sure they remember this is the Goldcrest, not some community center. As Clarissa clicked away, Sarah turned to Walter, an apology in her eyes. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have volunteered you like that. I just thought... Walter held up a hand. It's all right, Ms. Chen. In fact, I think you may have done me a favor. Sarah's brow furrowed in confusion. But before she could ask, her walkie-talkie crackled to life. Duty calls. 
she said with a rueful smile, hurrying off. Left alone, Walter felt a mix of emotions churning inside him. Anxiety about my anger. As he made his way back to the lobby, Walter's mind raced. He had always intended his book to expose the subtle, insidious forms of discrimination that persisted in places like the Goldcrest. But now, with the conference looming and tensions rising, he sensed a bigger story unfolding, one that could potentially shake the very foundations of this gilded fortress of privilege. The lobby's hustle and bustle enveloped him as he resumed his post by the door. To the guests streaming in and out, he was invisible once more. Just the man who opened the door with a polite nod and a good day. Little did they know that behind those kind eyes and gentle smile, a storm was brewing. Walter Thompson, once a warrior for civil rights, felt the old fire rekindling in his chest. He had started this job to write a book, to expose the truth. Now, he realized, he might have the chance to do much more. As the golden doors revolved, ushering in the privileged and the powerful, Walter stood tall. Let Hartley think he had put him in his place. Let the Clarissa Rothschilds of the world look right through him. Their ignorance was his armor, their prejudice, his weapon. Change was coming to the Goldcrest Hotel, whether they liked it or not. And Walter Thompson, the unassuming doorman with a hidden past, would be right at the heart of it. The stage was set, the players were in motion, and the real drama, Walter knew, was just beginning. The weeks leading up to the Civil Rights Conference flew by in a whirlwind of activity. Walter found himself at the center of a storm, balancing his regular duties with the increasing demands of conference preparation. Each day brought new challenges, but also new opportunities to gather material for his book. One particularly hectic afternoon, Walter was sorting through a mountain of paperwork in a small back office when a commotion in the lobby caught his attention. Peering out, he saw a familiar face that made his heart skip a beat. Marcus, his son, striding confidently across the marble floor. Walter's first instinct was to shrink back, to avoid being seen. But before he could retreat, Marcus's eyes locked onto him. Confusion, then shock, flashed across his son's face. Dad! Marcus called out, his voice a mix of disbelief and concern. What are you doing here? Walter stepped forward painfully aware of the curious glances from nearby staff and guests. Marcus, he said, trying to keep his voice steady. This is unexpected. Marcus closed the distance between them, his brow furrowed. Unexpected? Dad, why are you dressed like? Are you working here? Before Walter could formulate a response, Richard Hartley's voice boomed across the lobby. Mr. Thompson, our esteemed keynote speaker has arrived. I trust you'll show him every courtesy. Hartley approached, his plastic smile firmly in place, oblivious to the tension between father and son. Mr. Thompson, he said, addressing Marcus, welcome to the Goldcrest. I see you've already met our Walter. He'll be your personal attendant during your stay. Marcus's eyes widened, darting between his father and Hartley. I thank you, but that won't be necessary. I know my way around. Hartley's smile faltered slightly. I insist. Walter is our most experienced staff member. He'll ensure your stay is comfortable. The look Marcus gave Walter was filled with questions and a hint of betrayal. Fine, he said curtly. Walter, could you show me to my room, please? As they walked to the elevators, the silence between them was deafening. Once inside, away from prying eyes, Marcus turned to his father. What the hell is going on, Dad? You told us you were consulting for universities. Why are you working as a hotel doorman? Walter sighed heavily. The moment he'd been dreading for months had finally arrived. It's complicated, son. I'm doing research for my new book. I needed to experience things firsthand. Marcus ran a hand through his hair, frustration evident in every movement. Research? Dad, you're 68 years old. You should be enjoying retirement, not this. Does mom know? Your mother knows everything, Walter said softly. She doesn't like it, but she understands why it's important. The elevator dinged, opening onto a plush hallway. As they walked to Marcus's suite, the young lawyer shook his head. I don't understand. Why didn't you tell me? Walter stopped at the door, turning to face his son. Because I knew you'd try to talk me out of it. Marcus, the work I'm doing here, it's crucial. 
The discrimination, the subtle racism, it's all still here, just hidden behind golden doors and fake smiles. Marcus's expression softened slightly. Dad, I get it. I fight these battles in the courtroom every day, but this, it seems excessive. Walter placed a hand on his son's shoulder. Maybe so, but it's my fight, Marcus. Now, why don't you get settled? We can talk more later. As Marcus disappeared into his room, Walter leaned against the wall, emotions warring within him. The pride he felt at his son's accomplishments was tempered by the pain of deception and the fear of disappointing him. Later that evening, Walter found himself in the hotel's grand ballroom, overseeing the setup for the conference's opening reception. As he directed staff and checked place settings, Sarah Chen approached, a tablet in hand. Walter, she said, her voice low. I've been meaning to talk to you. That man earlier, the keynote speaker. I couldn't help but notice the resemblance. Walter stiffened slightly but kept his face neutral. Ms. Chen, I... It's your son, isn't it? Sarah interrupted, her eyes kind but searching. I did some digging after I saw your interaction. Dr. Walter Thompson, former professor of African American studies, civil rights activist. That's you, isn't it? For a moment, Walter considered denying it. But something in Sarah's expression, a mix of admiration and understanding, made him nod slowly. Yes, it's me. But please, this needs to stay between us. Sarah's eyes widened. Of course, but why? Walter, you're a legend in academic circles. Why are you here, pretending to be a simple doorman? Walter finished for her. He sighed, looking out over the ballroom. Because sometimes, Ms. Chen, the view from the bottom tells you more about the top than you could ever learn from being up there. Before Sarah could respond, a commotion near the entrance caught their attention. Richard Hartley was engaged in a heated discussion with an elegant older woman, Walter recognized as Evelyn Prescott, one of the hotel's major shareholders. Cannot allow this conference to damage our reputation, Richard, Evelyn was saying, her voice carrying across the room. The board is concerned about the element it might attract. Hartley nodded vigorously. I understand completely, Mrs. Prescott. I assure you we have measures in place to ensure our regular clientele won't be disturbed by any undesirable elements. Walter felt his fists clench at his sides. Sarah, noticing his reaction, placed a calming hand on his arm. Don't, she whispered. It's not worth it. But the fire that had driven Walter to march alongside Dr. King decades ago was rekindling. He straightened his uniform and strode towards Hartley and Mrs. Prescott. Excuse me, he said his voice carrying an authority that made both Hartley and Evelyn turn in surprise. I couldn't help but overhear your concerns about the conference. As the staff member overseeing the arrangements, I can assure you that all our guests will be treated with the utmost respect and dignity, regardless of their background. Hartley's face turned an alarming shade of red. Thompson, you are out of line, but Evelyn held up a hand her shrewd eyes studying Walter with newfound interest. No, let him speak. You say you're overseeing the arrangements. Walter nodded, standing tall under her scrutiny. Yes, ma'am. And I can promise you that this conference will bring nothing but credit to the Goldcrest. The speakers and attendees are some of the most respected minds in law, academia, and social justice. Their presence here is an honor, not a threat. For a long moment, Evelyn said nothing her gaze moving between Walter and a fuming Hartley. Finally, she nodded. Well said, Mr. Thompson, ma'am. Walter Thompson. Mr. Thompson, I look forward to seeing how this conference unfolds under your guidance. With that, she turned and swept out of the ballroom, leaving a stunned Hartley in her wake. As soon as she was gone, Hartley rounded on Walter, his voice a low, dangerous hiss. You've gone too far this time, Thompson. When this conference is over, you're done. Do you understand me? Done. Walter met Hartley's glare steadily. Perfectly, Mr. Hartley. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have work to do. As Hartley stormed off, Sarah approached Walter, her eyes wide with a mix of admiration and concern. Walter, that was... I've never seen anyone stand up to them like that. Walter allowed himself a small smile. Sometimes, Ms. Chen, you have to risk everything to change anything. As they returned to their tasks, Walter's mind raced. 
He had just placed himself squarely in the crosshairs of both Hartley and the hotel's power players. The stakes of his research had suddenly become much higher. But as he looked around the ballroom, envisioning it filled with champions of civil rights and social justice, Walter felt a familiar surge of purpose. The battle lines were drawn. The Goldcrest Hotel was about to become a battlefield in the ongoing struggle for equality and respect. And Walter Thompson, the unassuming doorman with a hidden past, was ready to lead the charge. The morning of the conference dawned bright and clear, a stark contrast to the tension simmering beneath the Goldcrest's gilded surface. Walter arrived early, his crisp uniform a stark contrast to the dark circles under his eyes. He'd spent most of the night tossing and turning, his mind a whirlwind of worry about Marcus, fear of Hartley's retribution, and anticipation for what the day might bring. As he entered through the staff entrance, he nearly collided with Sarah Chen, who was pacing nervously in the narrow hallway. Walter, she exclaimed, relief washing over her face. Thank goodness you're here. We have a situation, Walter's brow furrowed. What's wrong? Sarah lowered her voice, glancing around to ensure they weren't overheard. It's the keynote speaker, your son. He's threatening to pull out of the conference. Walter felt his heart drop. What? Why? He won't say exactly, Sarah replied, wringing her hands. He's holed up in his suite, refusing to speak to anyone. Mr. Hartley is having a meltdown. If we lose the keynote speaker, the whole conference could fall apart. Walter closed his eyes for a moment, taking a deep breath. He knew why Marcus was acting this way. It was because of him because of the lie he'd been living. I'll talk to him, he said finally. Sarah nodded gratefully. Thank you, Walter. I don't know what's going on between you two, but good luck. As Walter made his way to the elevator, he caught sight of Richard Hartley in the lobby, his face red as he berated a group of nervous-looking staff members. Their eyes met for a brief moment, and the hatred in Hartley's glare was palpable. The ride up to Marcus's suite felt interminable. When Walter finally stood outside the door, he hesitated, his hand hovering over the polished wood. What could he say to make this right? How could he explain years of deception? Before he could knock, the door swung open. Marcus stood there, impeccably dressed in a tailored suit, his face a mask of conflicting emotions. I thought I heard someone out here, he said, his voice carefully neutral. Come to try and talk me into staying, Dad? Or should I call you Walter? Like everyone else around here, Walter winced at the bitterness in his son's tone. Marcus, please, can we talk? For a moment, Walter thought Marcus might refuse, but then his son stepped aside, allowing him to enter the luxurious suite. As the door closed behind them, Marcus turned to face his father. You know, I've been up all night, trying to make sense of this. My father, Dr. Walter Thompson, respected academic and civil rights activist, working as a doorman. Was any of it real, Dad? The consulting work, the research you said you were doing. Walter sank into a nearby chair, suddenly feeling every one of his 68 years. It was all real, son, just not in the way you thought. Over the next hour, Walter poured out the whole story, his growing frustration with armchair activism, his desire to see firsthand how discrimination had evolved in the modern world, the book he was writing. As he spoke, he saw the anger in Marcus's eyes slowly give way to understanding, and finally, a grudging respect. You could have told me, Marcus said softly when Walter had finished. I would have understood. Walter shook his head. Would you? You've always seen me as the strong one, the fighter. I didn't want you to see me like this, serving people who looked down on me, enduring daily humiliations. Marcus leaned forward, his gaze intense. Dad, what you're doing? It's incredibly brave and important, but at what cost? I saw how that manager spoke to you yesterday. How long can you keep this up? Before Walter could respond, a commotion in the hallway caught their attention. Raised voices, the sound of running feet. Father and son exchanged a worried glance before moving to the door. In the corridor, chaos reigned. Hotel staff rushed back and forth, their faces pale with panic. Sarah Chen stood in the center of it all barking orders into a walkie-talkie. Ms. Chen, Walter called out, stepping into the hallway with Marcus close behind. What's happening? Sarah turned, relief flooding her features when she saw Marcus. Oh, thank goodness. 
Mr. Thompson, we need you downstairs immediately. There's been an incident. As they rode the elevator down, Sarah filled them in. A group of protesters had gathered outside the hotel, decrying the conference as elitist and out of touch with the real issues facing minority communities. Some had managed to breach the lobby, causing a scene that had sent the regular guests into a panic. When the elevator doors opened onto the lobby, they stepped into a war zone. The pristine marble floors were littered with broken glass and trampled flyers. Security guards grappled with angry protesters while terrified guests huddled in corners. In the center of it all stood Richard Hartley, his face purple with rage, as he shouted at both the protesters and his own staff, Get these animals out of my hotel! Where's Thompson? This is his fault! Walter felt a hand on his shoulder and turned to see Marcus, a determined look in his eyes. Dad, I think it's time we both stopped hiding. With a nod of understanding, Walter straightened his spine and strode forward, Marcus at his side. As they approached, the chaos seemed to part around them, protesters and guests alike, sensing the authority in their bearing. Mr. Hartley, Walter called out, his voice carrying over the din. I believe I can help resolve this situation. Hartley whirled, his eyes blazing. You! This is all you're doing, Thompson. I'll have your job for this, I swear I'll... That's enough! Marcus's voice cut through Hartley's tirade like a whip. I don't know who you think you're talking to, but that's Dr. Walter Thompson, one of the most respected civil rights activists of his generation. And I'm Marcus Thompson, your keynote speaker. Now, are you gonna let us handle this? Or would you prefer to keep making a fool of yourself? The shock on Hartley's face would have been comical if the situation weren't so serious. He opened and closed his mouth several times, no sound coming out, before finally stepping aside. Walter nodded gratefully to his son before turning to address the crowd. Ladies and gentlemen, please may I have your attention? Gradually, the noise died down as all eyes turned to Walter. Even the protesters seemed curious about this dignified older man in a doorman's uniform who commanded such respect. I understand there are concerns about this conference, Walter began, his voice strong and clear. Concerns that it's divorced from the real struggles facing our communities. I share those concerns. That's why I've spent the last year working here, experiencing firsthand the subtle and not so subtle discrimination that still plagues our society. A murmur ran through the crowd. Walter pressed on. This conference isn't about patting ourselves on the back for how far we've come. It's about acknowledging how far we still have to go. It's about bringing together minds from all walks of life to address the real, everyday injustices that persist. He gestured to Marcus. My son here was going to give a keynote speech about landmark court cases. Instead, I'm challenging him, challenging all of you, to use this conference to have the hard conversations, to look at the uncomfortable truths, to find new ways to fight for genuine equality. As Walter spoke, the tension in the room gradually dissipated. Protesters lowered their signs, listening intently. Hotel guests emerged from their hiding spots, drawn in by his words. When he finished, there was a moment of profound silence. Then slowly, applause began to build. It started with Marcus, then spread to Sarah, then to the protesters and guests alike. In that moment, as the Gold Crest lobby rang with unified applause, Walter felt a weight lift from his shoulders. His deception had been revealed, yes, but so had a greater truth. The battle for civil rights wasn't confined to courtrooms or protest marches. It was fought every day, in every interaction, in places high and low. As the applause died down and people began to disperse, Walter caught sight of Richard Hartley slinking away towards his office. The manager's face was a mix of confusion, anger, and just perhaps a glimmer of understanding. The conference would go on, but it would be unlike any the Goldcrest had ever seen. And Walter Thompson, no longer just a doorman, but once again a warrior for justice, would be at its heart. The storm had broken, but the real work was just beginning. The next morning, the Goldcrest Hotel buzzed with an energy unlike anything it had ever experienced. The lobby, restored to its usual gleaming splendor, now hosted a diverse mix of conference attendees, curious hotel guests, 
and even a few former protesters who had been invited to participate in the discussions. Walter, no longer in his doorman's uniform, but dressed in a well-worn tweed jacket that spoke of his academic past, stood at the entrance to the main conference hall. Beside him, Marcus fidgeted with his tie, a mix of pride and nervousness on his face. You ready for this, Dad? Marcus asked, his voice low. Walter took a deep breath, scanning the crowd. He saw faces filled with anticipation, skepticism, and hope. As ready as I'll ever be, son. Let's shake things up a bit, shall we? As they entered the hall, a hush fell over the assembled crowd. Walter could feel the weight of expectation on his shoulders. This wasn't just a conference anymore. It was a watershed moment. A chance to bridge the gap between ivory tower ideals and street-level realities. Sarah Chen, looking both exhausted and exhilarated, approached them with a tablet in hand. Dr. Thompson, Marcus, we've had to make some last-minute changes to the program. With your permission, we'd like to start with a joint keynote from both of you, followed by a panel discussion, including some of our unexpected guests. Walter nodded, a small smile playing on his lips. Sounds perfect, Ms. Chen. And please, Call me Walter. As they made their way to the stage, Walter caught sight of a familiar face in the front row. Evelyn Prescott, the shrewd hotel shareholder he had encountered earlier, sat with an unreadable expression, her eyes following his every move. The lights dimmed, and a spotlight illuminated the podium. Walter stepped up, acutely aware of the hundreds of eyes upon him. For a moment, he was transported back to his days as a fiery young activist, addressing crowds with passion and conviction. But now, tempered by age and experience, he knew the power of quiet truths. Ladies and gentlemen, he began, his voice steady and clear. Welcome to a conference that is not quite what any of us expected. Yesterday, many of you knew me as Walter the Doorman. Today, I stand before you as Dr. Walter Thompson, scholar, activist, and yes, undercover doorman. A ripple of laughter ran through the crowd breaking the tension. But titles and roles aside, I am here, as are all of you, because we share a common purpose. We seek justice, equality, and dignity for all. And yet, as my experiences here at the Goldcrest have shown me, we still have a long way to go. Over the next hour, Walter and Marcus tag-teamed their address, weaving together academic insights with raw, personal experiences. Walter spoke of the subtle slights and dismissive glances he'd endured as a doorman, while Marcus shared the challenges he faced as a young black lawyer in a system still riddled with prejudice. As they concluded, the hall erupted in applause, but Walter knew that applause alone wasn't enough. The real work was just beginning. The panel discussion that followed was unlike anything the Goldcrest had ever hosted. Alongside professors and policymakers sat community organizers former protesters, and even a few of the hotel's staff members, including Sarah Chen. As the discussion unfolded, touching on topics from workplace discrimination to community policing, Walter noticed Richard Hartley slip into the back of the hall. The manager's face was a mask of conflicting emotions, resentment, curiosity, and perhaps a hint of shame. During a break in the proceedings, Walter made his way to where Hartley stood, observing from the shadows. Mr. Hartley, Walter said, extending his hand. I believe we have some unfinished business. Hartley hesitated before shaking Walter's hand, his grip limp and uncertain. Dr. Thompson, I... I don't know what to say. I've behaved abominably. Walter nodded, his expression grave. Yes, you have. But that's not the end of the story, is it? The question is, what happens next? Before Hartley could respond, they were interrupted by Evelyn Prescott. Indeed, what does happen next? She asked, her keen eyes moving between the two men. Dr. Thompson, your little experiment has certainly stirred things up, but stirring isn't enough. What tangible changes do you propose? Walter straightened, meeting her gaze squarely. Mrs. Prescott, I believe the Goldcrest has an opportunity here, an opportunity to lead by example, to show that luxury and equality aren't mutually exclusive. I'm proposing a comprehensive review of hiring practices, staff training on unconscious bias, and a commitment to hosting more diverse events. Evelyn's eyebrow arched. And you think our clientele will accept this? Shift in focus. 
I think they'll embrace it, Walter countered. The world is changing, Mrs. Prescott. Those who adapt will thrive. Those who don't. He let the implication hang in the air. Evelyn studied him for a long moment before a slow smile spread across her face. Well, Dr. Thompson, it seems we have much to discuss. Perhaps you'd join me for dinner this evening? We can talk about the future of the Goldcrest and your role in it. As Evelyn walked away, Hartley turned to Walter, his face a mix of confusion and dawning realization. My job. You're after my job, aren't you? Walter shook his head. No, Mr. Hartley. I'm after change. Whether you're part of that change is up to you. As the day wore on, the energy in the conference hall only seemed to grow. Discussions became more heated, more real. People shared personal stories of discrimination, of small victories and crushing defeats. Through it all, Walter moved among the crowd, listening, encouraging, challenging. During a particularly intense debate about gentrification, Walter felt a hand on his arm. He turned to find Sarah Chen, her eyes shining with unshed tears. Walter, she said, her voice thick with emotion. I just wanted to thank you. What you've done here, it's given me the courage to speak up, to stop being a bystander. Walter squeezed her hand. You've always had that courage, Sarah. Sometimes we just need a little push to find it. As the sun began to set, casting long shadows through the gold crests ornate windows, Walter found a quiet corner to catch his breath. The day had been exhausting, exhilarating, and utterly transformative. Marcus joined him, loosening his tie with a sigh. Well, Dad, I'd say we've well and truly stirred the pot. You think any of this will actually lead to change? Walter looked out over the crowd, seeing animated discussions happening in every corner. He saw Hartley deep in conversation with a group of staff members, his usual haughty demeanor replaced by one of genuine listening. He saw Evelyn Prescott in what appeared to be a heated but respectful debate with one of the former protesters. Change is already happening, son, Walter said softly. The real question is, where do we go from here? As if in answer, Sarah approached with her tablet. I hate to interrupt, but we've just received some news. It seems word of our unconventional conference has spread. We're getting calls from other hotels, universities, even some corporations. They want to know more about our innovative approach to diversity and inclusion. Walter and Marcus exchanged a look of surprise and growing excitement. What had started as one man's undercover mission had blossomed into something much larger, much more impactful. Well, Walter said, a slow smile spreading across his face. I guess we'd better get to work. We've got a lot of doors to open. As they moved to rejoin the conference, Walter felt a sense of purpose, stronger than anything he'd experienced in years. The battle for equality was far from over, but here in the most unlikely of places, a new chapter was being written. The Goldcrest Hotel, once a bastion of privilege, was becoming a beacon of change, and Walter Thompson, no longer hidden behind a doorman's uniform, was leading the charge. The future, with all its challenges and possibilities, awaited, and for the first time in a long while, Walter felt ready to meet it head on. The final day of the conference dawned with an air of anticipation. The Goldcrest Hotel, usually a bastion of quiet luxury, hummed with energy. In the lobby, clusters of attendees debated passionately, their voices a mix of hope and frustration. Hotel staff, emboldened by the events of the past few days, moved among the guests with a new confidence, engaging in conversations they would have shied away from just a week ago. Walter Thompson stood at the center of it all, a calm eye in the storm of change he had helped unleash. He was dressed in a suit that bridged his two worlds, professional enough for a keynote speaker, but with the comfortable wear of a man who knew real work. As he observed the scene, he felt a tap on his shoulder. Dr. Thompson, it was Jeremy, one of the younger bellhops, there's someone here to see you, says it's urgent. Walter followed Jeremy to a quiet corner of the lobby, where a familiar face awaited him. It was Robert Caldwell, the CEO of the hotel chain that owned the Goldcrest. Dr. Thompson, Caldwell said, his voice tight with barely contained anger. I think it's time we had a chat. Walter nodded, gesturing to a pair of plush armchairs. As they sat, he could feel the weight of Caldwell's gaze. I've been watching the news, Thompson, 
quite the spectacle you've created here. Care to explain why you've turned my flagship hotel into a circus? Walter met Caldwell's glare steadily. Mr. Caldwell, what's happening here isn't a circus. It's progress. It's the future. Caldwell leaned forward, his voice low and dangerous. The future? Let me tell you about the future, Thompson. Our bookings are down 30% for the next quarter. Long-time clients are threatening to take their business elsewhere. The board is in an uproar. Change is never easy, Mr. Caldwell, Walter replied calmly. But it's necessary. The world is evolving, and the Gold Crest, your entire chain, has a chance to lead that evolution. Caldwell's laugh was bitter. Lead? We're in the business of luxury, Thompson, not social justice. I'm shutting this conference down. Today. And you? You'll be lucky if I don't press charges for fraud. As Caldwell stood to leave, Walter rose to meet him. Before you do anything rash, Mr. Caldwell, I suggest you take a look around. Really look. Reluctantly, Caldwell followed Walter's gaze. They saw Sarah Chen deep in conversation with a group of executives, her usual timidity replaced by passionate articulation. Near the check-in desk, Richard Hartley was actually smiling as he helped a diverse group of guests, his usual disdain nowhere to be seen. This isn't just about social justice, Mr. Caldwell, Walter said softly. It's about adapting to a changing world. It's about tapping into new markets, attracting a new generation of clients who value inclusivity and social responsibility. Caldwell's expression wavered, doubt creeping in. And you think this experiment can actually benefit our bottom line? Before Walter could respond, they were interrupted by Evelyn Prescott, approaching with a group of sharply dressed individuals. Robert, Evelyn said, her tone frosty. I see you've met Dr. Thompson. I hope you're not giving him too hard a time. The board is quite impressed with the innovations happening here. Caldwell blinked in surprise. The board? But I thought, you thought wrong, Evelyn cut in. Allow me to introduce you to our newest partners. They're very interested in expanding our inclusive luxury concept to their hotel chains in Europe and Asia. As Evelyn made introductions, Walter watched Caldwell's face transition from shock to grudging interest. The businessman in him couldn't ignore the potential of what was unfolding. Excusing himself from the group, Walter made his way to the conference hall for the final keynote address. As he approached the stage, he saw Marcus deep in conversation with a group of young activists, their faces alight with purpose. The hall fell silent as Walter took the podium, looking out over the sea of faces, hotel staff and executives, activists and academics, the privileged and the marginalized. He felt the weight of the moment. Ladies and gentlemen, he began, his voice strong and clear. When I first walked through the doors of the Gold Crest as a doorman, I thought I was beginning a solitary journey, a lone researcher trying to uncover the hidden biases in our society. What I discovered was so much more. He paused, his eyes scanning the crowd. I discovered that change doesn't come from one person's actions, but from the collective will of many. From the housekeeper who dares to speak up against injustice, to the executive who chooses to listen and learn. As Walter spoke, he saw Richard Hartley slip into the back of the hall, his face a mask of conflicting emotions. The past few days have shown us that luxury and equality are not mutually exclusive, that a hotel can be both a beacon of opulence and a bastion of fairness. But make no mistake, this is just the beginning. Walter's voice grew more passionate. The real work starts now. Implementing new hiring practices, training programs, community outreach. It won't be easy. There will be resistance, setbacks, moments of doubt. But if what I've seen here is any indication, we are more than up to the challenge. As he concluded his speech, the hall erupted in a standing ovation. But Walter's eyes were drawn to the back, where he saw Caldwell and Hartley in what appeared to be an intense discussion. After the applause died down and people began to file out, Walter made his way to where the two men stood. Gentlemen, he said, approaching cautiously. I hope I'm not interrupting. Caldwell turned, his expression unreadable. Thompson, it seems I owe you an apology and perhaps a job offer. Walter raised an eyebrow. 
A job offer? Hartley cleared his throat, looking uncomfortable. We, that is Mr. Caldwell and I, we've been discussing the future of the Goldcrest and the chain as a whole. We think, well, we think we could use someone with your perspective to help guide us through these changes. Walter was momentarily speechless. This was more than he had ever anticipated when he first donned the doorman's uniform. I, I'm honored, he finally managed. But I'm not sure I'm the right person for a corporate position. My strengths lie in research, in teaching. Caldwell nodded, which is exactly why we need you. Not as a full-time executive, but as a consultant. To help us implement these changes. To train our staff. To keep us accountable. As Walter considered the offer, he felt a hand on his shoulder. It was Marcus, beaming with pride. What do you think, son? Walter asked. Should your old man dive back into the corporate world? Marcus laughed. I think, Dad, that you've never really left the fight. This is just a new battlefield. As father and son shared a moment of understanding, Sarah Chen approached, her tablet in hand as always. I hate to interrupt, she said, her eyes shining with excitement. But you all need to see this. We're trending on social media. The hashtag Goldcrest Revolution is exploding. People are calling for other hotels, other industries, to follow our lead. Walter looked around at the faces surrounding him. Caldwell's grudging respect. Hartley's dawning understanding. Sarah's newfound confidence. Marcus's unwavering support. He thought of Emma at home, who had stood by him through this entire journey. In that moment, Walter Thompson realized that his work was far from over. In fact, it was just beginning. Well... He said, a slow smile spreading across his face. I guess we have our work cut out for us. Mr. Caldwell, Mr. Hartley, shall we discuss the terms of my consultancy? As they moved towards Caldwell's office, Walter felt a sense of purpose, stronger than anything he'd experienced in years. The gold crest was changing, and with it, perhaps the world. The revolution had begun, and Walter Thompson, once a hidden warrior for justice, was now its visible champion. The future, with all its challenges and possibilities, stretched out before them, and for the first time in a long while, it looked bright indeed. Six months had passed since the groundbreaking conference at the Goldcrest Hotel. The crisp autumn air carried a sense of change as Walter Thompson walked through the gleaming lobby, nodding at familiar faces. The hotel buzzed with a different energy now, one of purpose, and inclusivity. Walter was no longer in a doorman's uniform, nor was he in the stuffy tweed jacket of his professorial days. Instead, he wore a smart casual outfit that reflected his new role as the chain's chief diversity and inclusion consultant. It was a position that allowed him to bridge worlds, much as he had done during his undercover days. As he made his way to the conference room for the quarterly review meeting, Walter reflected on the whirlwind of changes the past months had brought. The conference room was already full when he arrived. Robert Caldwell sat at the head of the table, his usual stern expression now tempered with a hint of anticipation. Richard Hartley, looking more relaxed than Walter had ever seen him, was engaged in animated conversation with Sarah Chen, who had been promoted to Director of Community Outreach. Ah, Walter, there you are. Caldwell said, gesturing for him to take a seat. Shall we begin? Walter nodded, pulling out his tablet. Indeed, I think you'll all be pleased with the progress we've made. Over the next hour, Walter presented a comprehensive report on the changes implemented across the Goldcrest chain. New hiring practices had increased diversity at all levels of staffing. Sensitivity training programs had dramatically reduced complaints of discrimination. Community outreach initiatives had transformed the hotel's relationships with their local neighborhoods. And the bottom line? Caldwell asked, leaning forward. Walter couldn't help but smile. I think you'll like this part, Robert. Despite initial concerns, our bookings are up 15% from last year. We're seeing a significant influx of younger, socially conscious clients. Several major corporations have switched their conference bookings to us, citing our commitment to inclusivity. A murmur of approval went around the table. Even Hartley, who had been the most resistant to change initially, nodded in satisfaction. There's more, Sarah chimed in, her eyes shining with excitement. We've been approached by several universities about internship programs. 
They're calling us a real-world laboratory for social change. As the meeting concluded, Walter felt a deep sense of satisfaction, but he knew the work was far from over. Before we wrap up, he said, I'd like to propose our next initiative. We've made great strides within our organization, but I believe it's time we looked outward. I'm suggesting a mentorship program, partnering with schools in underprivileged areas to provide hospitality training and job opportunities. Caldwell raised an eyebrow. That's quite ambitious, Walter. The board might need some convincing. Then let's convince them, Walter replied, his voice firm. We've proven that doing the right thing can also be good for business. This is our chance to truly make a lasting impact. As they left the conference room, Walter felt a hand on his shoulder. It was Hartley, looking uncharacteristically humble. Dr. Thompson, he began. I owe you an apology. When you first came here, I... Well, I was part of the problem. I want you to know, I'm committed to being part of the solution now. Walter smiled, shaking Hartley's hand warmly. That's all any of us can do, Richard. Recognize our mistakes and strive to do better. As Walter made his way through the hotel, he marveled at the changes. The staff was more diverse than ever, and interacted with guests with a new level of confidence and respect. In the bar, he overheard a group of executives discussing their company's new diversity initiatives. Inspired by their stay at the Goldcrest, outside the hotel's facade bore a new addition, a plaque commemorating the Gold Crest Revolution and its impact on the hospitality industry. Walter paused to read it, feeling a mix of pride and humility. His phone buzzed with a message from Marcus. Dad, guess who just got invited to speak at Harvard Law about our work at Goldcrest? See you at dinner to celebrate. Walter's heart swelled with pride. His son had become a powerful advocate in his own right, using his legal expertise to push for systemic changes in corporate America. As the sun began to set, casting a golden glow over the city, Walter decided to take a detour before heading home. He walked to a small park nearby, one he used to pass every day in his dormant persona. There, on a bench overlooking a small pond, sat Emma, his wife and partner, in all things. I thought I might find you here, he said, sitting beside her. Emma smiled, taking his hand. Old habits die hard. I still come here sometimes. Imagining you walking by in that uniform, they sat in comfortable silence for a moment, watching the play of light on the water. Did you ever imagine it would turn out like this? Emma asked softly. Walter shook his head. Never. When I started this journey, I thought I was just gathering material for a book. I never dreamed I'd be spearheading a movement. Emma squeezed his hand. You've always had it in you, Walter. You just needed the right stage. As they sat there, Walter's mind wandered to the future. The changes at Goldcrest were just the beginning. Other hotels, other industries were starting to take notice. There were talks of government task forces, of new legislation. The ripples of their little revolution were spreading far and wide. You know, Walter said thoughtfully, I think it's time I started writing that book. Emma laughed. I was wondering when you'd get around to that. Any ideas for a title? Walter grinned. How about opening doors? How one man's undercover journey sparked a revolution. As they stood to leave, Walter took one last look at the Gold Crest Hotel, its windows glowing warmly in the twilight. He thought of all the lives that had been touched, all the minds that had been opened. He thought of the challenges still ahead, the work yet to be done. But most of all, he thought of the countless doors yet to be opened. Doors of opportunity, of understanding, of change, and he knew, with a certainty that warmed him to his core, that he would keep opening those doors for as long as he was able. Come on, Emma said, tugging gently at his hand. Marcus and his fiancée are waiting, and I hear Sarah and some of the others might drop by later to celebrate. Walter nodded, turning away from the hotel. As they walked home hand in hand, he felt a profound sense of gratitude for Emma's unwavering support for Marcus's fierce advocacy, for the unexpected allies he'd found along the way, but most of all, for the chance to make a difference, to leave the world a little better than he'd found it. The story of Walter Thompson, Professor Dorman Changemaker, was far from over. In fact, in many ways, it was just beginning. As he and Emma walked into the soft evening light, 
Walter knew that whatever challenges lay ahead, he was ready to face them. After all, he had learned that the most important doors to open were not made of wood or glass, but were the doors to people's minds and hearts. And those, he had discovered, were the most rewarding doors of all. As they turned the corner towards home, the Gold Crest Hotel stood tall behind them, no longer just a symbol of luxury, but a beacon of change. And in its golden glow, the promise of a better tomorrow shone bright. And there you have it, folks. The incredible journey of Walter Thompson. From undercover doorman to catalyst for change. The morale of our story? Never underestimate the power of one person to make a difference. Each of us, no matter our position or background, has the ability to open doors, not just physical ones, but doors of opportunity, understanding and equality. So, what doors will you open today? How will you challenge the status quo and push for positive change in your own life and community? Remember, every small action can create ripples that turn into waves of transformation. If you enjoyed this story of courage, perseverance, and social change, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel for more inspiring tales. Hit that notification bell to stay updated on our latest uploads. And hey, share this video with someone who needs a reminder that they have the power to make a difference. Leave a comment below telling us about a time when you stood up against discrimination or made a positive change in your community. Your story could inspire others to take action. Thanks for watching, and remember, be the change you wish to see in the world. Until next time.